Good morning, everyone. I um, am just thrilled to be here. Thank you for that generous introduction. Uh, I spoke to this audience last year, and it's really a delight to be back to share with you some of the work that is going on at GSA. Uh, I just need to apologize. My voice is kind of a little smoky. I've got the allergies that I think half of the room probably has as well. Uh, and the meds I have um, say I can get dizzy. <laughs> so, uh, so we'll see what happens here. Uh, but at any rate, I'm delighted to be here. I bring greetings from President Obama and from my colleagues in the administration uh, with whom I think we are engaging on some tremendous uh, work together. I also bring you personal greetings uh, as, a, as a businesswoman. And I want to say that that is actually something I feel as my identity. Uh, while my role right now is in government, I carry with me uh, a personal identity as a businesswoman. <clears throat> and I, I want to speak to you from that frame as well as from the frame of um, the General Services Administration. I have to say that I have been a part of a variety of businesses. Um, architecture, uh, diversity consulting, executive search, manufacturing, uh, IT, uh, and government strategy consulting. Uh, so I know about Mobus contracts because I was a Mobus contractor, and I know about scope creep because I was a project manager, uh, and I know about the patience and diligence that is required to do business with the government. I understand that because as a small business serving um, a large government, there uh, was a lot of that in my life at one point. I also know that uh, I know enough to be dangerous about the IT industry. Uh, having been a part of it um, most recently uh, since my uh, tenure uh, in the uh, Clinton administration. And I want to say my hat is off to you uh, for being in a sector of our economy that changes with the blink of an eye and is the darling of our growth projections. I think that is a burden uh, as well as an opportunity and I want to thank you for leading uh, leading the charge in terms of our economy and in terms of our innovation. And I want to get into that a little bit. Um, having listed a bit of my resume to you, I suppose you could um, offer one critique, which is that I can't keep a job. Uh, I do want to let you know I'm at GSA now and I'm going to be staying. Uh, I intend to stay for six years. So uh, I'm hoping that what we're laying out for the direction for GSA is uh, a really foundational uh, there's a lot of change going on, and I want to take you through some of that. As you know, GSA's mission is to use our expertise, our expertise to provide innovation, innovative solutions for our customers in support of their missions, and by so doing, foster and get this right, effective, sustainable, and transparent government for the American people. Each of those words is chosen quite carefully. In other words, we, just, we support the Department of Veterans Affairs so that they can support the veterans. And we provide infrastructure for the Department of Commerce so that they can promote American industry both here and abroad. When I think, however, about the GSA business model, I have to say that I uh, sometimes have flashes of my business school strategy professors. I think they would cringe uh, if they heard me describe our business proposition because uh, there is this problem with what is our niche. Uh, it, GSA actually does everything for everybody. It is very hard to focus in on a business proposition. We simply uh, do everything in every direction. It's kind of an anti-strategy strategy. And it is, uh, GSA is truly vast. It's one of the formidable things about this job. It's not that pieces of the job are that hard. It is that it is so big. Our customers, as you know, range across all branches of government. Uh, the legislative branch, the executive branch, uh, the judiciary, state and local. Interestingly, in our real estate division, our largest customer is the judiciary. On the acquisition side, our largest customer is the Department of Defense. So we have um, uh, no one customer. We serve everyone, and we also do everything, as you know. We work in design, real estate management, IT, fleet, credit cards and financial services, travel services commodities, and other generalized services, as well as disposal. We have it all, notice, from design to disposal. Our people, and I like to say they range from A to Z, but they actually range from A to A because we go the full cycle and start again. We range from architects to auctioneers. We truly do everything for everyone. So as I talk about GSA, I want us to 
constantly to be thinking about how uh, there are places within GSA that we can energize and engage and um, not think of it as monolithic. Frankly, our positioning is actually pretty precise, and I describe it as membrane. We are the membrane between government and industry. And it is <clears throat> a membrane that needs to be healthy and porous, transferring knowledge and interpreting market signals to our government customers on the one hand, and transmitting their requirements to the private sector on the other. So we have a very important porous role to be played here. Under ordinary circumstances, this is a big job, and these are not ordinary circumstances. Our country right now is facing some serious challenges, both home and abroad. Our fantastic military needs support. Our cherished veterans need care. Our children need good schools. And our infrastructure needs more than just a facelift. Too many Americans, too many Americans, and we know them, they are members of our communities, in our families, they are our friends, and they are feeling the terrible anxiety and pressures of unemployment, and we have a long way to go before our economy is fully on its feet again. That said, we are seeing encouraging news. Two years after a harsh, harsh recession, our economy is growing and showing real signs of strength, steady and real signs. We've gained almost two million private sector jobs in the past 13 months, and for the fourth month in a row, the unemployment rate has dropped, most recently to 8.8% in March. To continue and intensify this growth, President Obama has set an ambitious course for the government and for the full nation. The way I hear him say it, he is not talking about returning to OK. His message is about out innovating, out educating, and out building the rest of the world. That is not an OK agenda. And you know, America has done this before. We have mapped the human genetic code. We've peered into the far reaches of the sky. We've brought the internet to millions. We have lifted, lifted untold numbers out of poverty. We have stamped out diseases. We built the finest schools, community colleges, and universities in the world. But, and we all know this, no one did this in a vacuum or as a one-man band. This is not a solo story or a loner adventure. We did this in partnership, government and industry, hand in hand, arm in arm, together. Together we have tackled research, discovery, entrepreneurship, financing, skill building, incentives, markets, and taking to scale. We have learned a tremendous amount together. We've shared risk while seeking to avoid the reckless. And our nation has grown and prospered from this partnership. But the government industry partnership cannot stand pat. It needs continuous, continuous tending and nurturing. It's like my garden, the weeds keep growing. We need to nurture and tend it. So let me tease out uh, what the handshakes in this partnership look like to me uh, at this time. And I have a couple of prepared notes here because I want to be sure I'm managing my time because I want to get to questions. So I'm going to share a couple of notions about this with you and then I'd like to hear what you would like to talk about. Right now the government needs your industry's innovation muscle. We all know that the IT industry requires innovation to stay in the game. You know firsthand the challenges faced by an ever-shifting business environment. For example, every five years there's a tenfold increase in the volume of digital information. You're facing that down. Uh, for example, Cisco estimates that over one trillion devices will be connected to the internet. One trillion will be connected to the internet by 2013. And according to Forrester Research, 25% of personal computing devices sold will be tablets by 2015. You are facing that down. For example, communications and social media have set off tectonic shifts in our society. Ten years ago, we had no idea what a tablet or a Twitter feed was. Uh, you are facing that down. Uh, perhaps I should say you're Facebooking that down. So, there's, so that's the important role uh, that you play. On the other side of the equation, the federal government is the single largest purchaser of IT goods and services in the world. 
over $80 billion annually. At GSA, we're working hard to link these two pieces. Remember what I said about membrane. You, the IT professional, professionals and innovation engine, to our customer agencies so that they can understand and find the right solutions. An agency's challenges are significant. Our customers are under duress. Federal agencies, certainly state and local, are facing budgets that are uncertain, yet certainly diminished and diminished by a lot. GSA's uh, real estate uh, uh, construction budget this year was slashed by 90%. Government agencies need to provide top quality services to the public while navigating increasingly complex IT requirements for cybersecurity, data center consolidation, sustainability, and cloud computing. To help them, GSA is rolling out a full spectrum of end-to-end -end strategic IT solutions and complete life cycle acquisition support. We develop agency requirements, create the right acquisition vehicles, and build IT procurement packages that are faster, easier, greener, more secure, and importantly, more, effect, more efficient. So here are a couple of stories I would like to tell. First, about the government and data centers and cloud computing. I kind of figured you'd be asking questions about that, so let me see if I can head you off. Over the past decade, the private sector has reduced their reliance on home-owned data fields. IBM, for example, went from 235 data centers in 1997 to 12 in 2009. But the reverse is true in government. In 1998, the government had 432 data centers. Ten years later, we have nearly 2,100. In square footage terms, that equals about five and a half football fields worth of server space. But unlike most football fields, many of these server data racks were only used intermittent, intermittently and at peak times. The rest of the year, they are idle, but still drain energy. We design for peak performance. We estimate that utility costs per square foot for data centers are easily 80 to 100 times as much as standard commercial real estate. In 2006, federal servers and data centers used more than 6 billion, billion kilowatt hours of electricity. That utilization rate put the government on target to exceed 12 billion kilowatt hours by this year. That's not really a target, that's where we're going. Enough to power nearly a million homes for a full year. That kind of energy use and the resources required to maintain it is neither practical nor strategic, and it's certainly expensive. Indeed, this growth is costly, inefficient, redundant, and unsustainable. It's clear that data center consolidation is the right move and the prudent decision for agencies, and you can hardly argue because industry is moving there. But what do we do with the data from the centers? Where does it go, and how can we be sure that agencies are keeping their information secure and getting the best value? And the answer is the cloud. GSA is poised to lead agencies there. Federal CIO Vivek Kundra estimates there are over $20 billion in federal IT resources that are cloud compatible, and agencies need to move in this direction. So I just want to be really explicit about this. This is not moving everything to the cloud. This is moving some $20 billion worth of our IT resources to the cloud. Those are the prudent and I think uh, appropriate uh, subcategory of all our IT resources. At one relatively small data center not far from here in Rockville, Maryland, the Department of Health and Human Services was spending 1.2 million each year on electricity. That center, along with dozens of others, has now been shuttered, saving the agencies money and allowing them to focus their resources on vital missions. To help agencies consolidate, GSA is shifting our own operations and building contract offerings for customers. We are in this unique enterprise uh, position where this is not just an IT challenge, this is a building challenge, and lo and behold, we do both. Our goal is to make it easy for agencies to adopt cloud services. We already have an impressive suite of options, including our Alliant and Alliant Small Business Contracts that are flexible, workable, and perfect for agencies with complex requirements and special needs. But Seeing the clear need for trusted cloud services, GSA is also awarding two blanket purchase agreements for cloud offerings that will be easy to use and offer firm, fixed, negotiated prices to leverage the buying power of the federal government. One of these agreements is for infrastructure as a service. It was awarded last October, and it includes cloud storage, virtual machines, and web hosting as the offerings on tap 
to agency customers. The other, email as a service is really about amplifying the collaborative capabilities of the cloud, and it has a cast iron value business case to support it, so agencies are paying attention. Participating agencies will be billed for the service based on the number of mailboxes used. The cloud provider supplies and maintains the infrastructure, and the anticipated return on investment in converting is less than two years. Indeed, the average cost per mailbox on a cloud platform is a little over $14 per box per month. That's a full 44% cheaper than on-premise email systems, and it nets out to an annual savings of over a million dollars per 7,500 customers. Perhaps best of all, the acquisition of cloud services can be done easier, better, and faster at think minutes, not months. Already 15 agencies have identified 950,000 email boxes across 100 email systems that are going to move to the cloud. With GSA's contracting knowledge and customer-focused expertise, we will move the needle even further and faster. So that's the first uh, story. Now let me tell you a second. This is about the government workplace of the future. And we use the, a peculiar, peculiarly government word for this. We call it telework. Never heard of it outside the government. There is a bill that has been signed into law about telework. There are budget pressures that are going to lead agencies to seek rent reductions from space reductions that are going to encourage telework. But mostly telework is in our future because you, the private sector, has set the pace. You've created the devices, understand the IT backbone, familiarized us with chat functions, and demonstrated the culture change required. The government needs to make this change as well. I have to confess I'm a bit of a zealot about this because I learned how sensible this was when I was in the private sector myself. When I worked at CSC, uh, we got instant messaging and in about two months the whole place changed. And it, uh, we also learned, and frankly, it became pretty apparent to everybody pretty quickly, that it didn't make sense when I had some technology capability introduced me. It didn't make sense anymore to wake up in Annapolis, drive all the way to Fairfax for a 2 a.m. conference call with India. I could do it in my kitchen. And I want you to know that my kitchen figures a lot in this telework story. Uh, it's really about... <laughs> It's about the kitchen and when you need to leave the house because you want to get away from your kitchen, but it is also that you can get a lot of work done there. Then I moved into the government. I joined the Obama administration a little over a year ago, and because of the snow Palooza, if you all remember that, last year I was actually sworn into office virtually from my kitchen. So telework got me going here. Um, the government is on to telework. We can see the efficiencies and the sensibilities of this capability. But we have a really significant journey in front of us. Uh, there, is a lot, there are a lot of rocks in this river. At GSA, we are doing everything short of somersaults to telework ourselves, to practice ourselves, to model this, to show agencies these efficiencies, to argue the sustainability benefits, and explain the security advantages. There's a huge business case for telework. We believe deeply that work is what you do, not where you are. And we need your help with this. Your partnership, your modeling, your best practices will boost us along. Help us help the government get going on this. And a third story, and these are shortening as I go, again and again, about the workplace of the future. I don't know, uh, but uh, you might be aware that near the White House downtown is our headquarters building. And it's currently under renovation. Uh, it's the only building that uh, still exists in Washington, a major office building that has air, conditionings hanging, air conditioners hanging out of every window. Um, but we were blessed with recovery money, and we are uh, beginning a huge renovation project of that century-old building. When we moved out in December, it was home to some 2,000 employees. But when the construction is complete, we aim to collapse all of the Washington area GSA people into that building. That will amount to putting 6,000 people back into it. We're going to triple the building's capacity. We call it our extreme challenge. But this will only be, be, this will only be possible because we will be using collaborative technologies, space scheduling software, mobile and virtual work tools, secure yet easily accessible information, good video conferencing and telepresence, and more. Again, we will be relying on your innovation, serving ourselves up as the champions and the models of how to use these new technologies 
in the government, and together we can influence and change all of government into a more progressive, virtual, and collaborative work environment. And there are many more stories. Stories of using innovative technologies to close gaps between the government and citizens by solving problems with online challenges. Innovating with new smart building systems to run our buildings more efficiently. And sensing and collecting data on our fleet vehicles to understand and improve maintenance and performance and much more. Your innovation plus our proving ground posture and membrane positioning can help move government to higher levels of performance. We will all enjoy government for this great nation that works and works ever better. So to achieve this, we need a business sector and a tech community that are competitive and vibrant and innovative. The economy of the future will succeed because of your innovation, your invention, and your reinvention. At GSA, we are absolutely firm in our resolve to work with you, to hear you, to share ideas, to listen, to collect wisdom, to shed lessons, and to collaborate with you. It's through partnerships with the IT community that we'll be able to succeed for our citizens, for our country, for the economy, and for the future of this great country. Thank you very much for that. I am looking forward to the arm-in-arm, hand-in-hand uh, partnership that we will uh, engage in to build a government that works ever better and harder for the American people. And I am looking forward to your questions so that I can uh, respond to the things that you're particularly interested in. So, there's microphones in the aisles. Um, who has a question? Yes. Test, test. It's not on you can come up here. Test one, two. Oh, there you go. Hi, Elaine Hoffman with CSC. Um, you have proposed and already awarded one of these vehicles for moving, thing, moving agencies to the cloud. Yes. And you have another one coming out. Have you have, do you have many commitments from the agencies to use your vehicles, or are they just committed to moving to the cloud in some fashion? You know, it is, uh, the, we're on a tipping point right now. Uh, it, because our BPA for email service is um, becoming a reality and we have had a uh, government-wide group working on it, defining requirements and get engaged in it, uh, there's been a lot more awareness of it. Um, now when I go to the President's Management Council, the Deputy Secretaries come up to me and say, when is it available? Uh, so there is, um, uh, there's a poll from the customers that I haven't seen before. I haven't personally heard from that level of leadership. Um, uh, Vivek, is, Vivek Kundra is talking about uh, being quite uh, strong in signaling that this um, BPA for email will be, he's using the word mandatory. I always shy away from the word mandatory when it comes to GSA. I think we should earn our business, not be told uh, that you have to do business with us. But I think he is trying to goad uh, people, steer them, maybe that's a better word, towards uh, using uh, these tools uh, just to get us up the ramp. Uh, I know they have uh, placed some requirements on agencies in the, in the next 14 months, I guess, to get on a couple of uh, cloud, um, uh, a couple of, uh, of, you know, a couple of systems on the cloud. So there's a, a lot of interest in this. The other piece to this is, is of course, we are on the brink of um, uh, bringing in our own cloud email, and everybody's also watching that story quite a bit, and it is allowing them to see that if we're doing it, again, we're modeling maybe it's possible. So I think there's a whole lot of things coming together and people, uh, agencies I think will be moving towards this BPA pretty rapidly. That's, that's my impression. Rick Morton with HP. Um, thank you for your comments this morning and uh, did want to ask, um, how do you reconcile um, your vision of the cloud with what uh, Ms. Takai is doing, particularly in the DOD? She, said if we move to the cloud now, it would kind of be a disaster because of the cybersecurity implications and uh, you know, those kinds of things. So I see a lot of movement kind of in parallel, and I'm not sure if you're talking to them or they're talking to you all. So. You know, there, there are a couple of things about this. When I was in industry, this was also a big question, always. You know, how can we be sure um, that our data is secure? And industry is just as concerned about the security of its data as, uh, as is government, frankly. Uh, we certainly have a stewardship and a concern about it um, uh, from a cybersecurity point of view as well. 
Uh, I believe that, as Vivek has pointed out, and as the studies have pointed out, uh, there is a subset of our data that can very safely go to the cloud. Uh, there, there is, there is uh, data, there are systems that should be uh, in a very protected environment and the cloud is perhaps not the answer. But I think that it is, a, um, uh, is something that we are going to have to um, keep being reasonable about as we choose the systems that we put on the cloud. Uh, and I know that there is always the anxiety about security. We simply need to work through that one day at a time, one issue at a time. Uh, and uh, our Fed ramp process, um, some of the uh, uh, pieces that we're putting in place for um, more continuous monitoring of our security are the kinds of attitudes and, and processes that we need to have in place. I, um, I know that the DOD is in a particularly different world and they have a whole lot of um, systems that obviously need to have their own integrity. But I think on the civilian side, there is a lot we can do, and I think cybersecurity should not be um, uh, a sort of um, wall, a, a monolithic wall. We need to find the places where we can do this. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Lauren Nash from Achieva. And the president recently released an executive order on customer service. Yes. I was wondering what GSA is doing or planning on doing to improve customer service. I'm planning on having a meeting on Friday with my leadership to talk about that. Um, yes, I was, um, I was uh, privileged to be part of some of the drafting of that customer service. I'm delighted that the White House is coming out being explicit about how customer service is important and that we need to not just talk nicey-nicey, but we need to demonstrate and show real initiatives around this where we're monitoring, measuring, um, and analyzing. Now, all of you in industry know, and I sure know when I was in industry, the customer service surveys have a certain value and, uh, and that we need to penetrate through the sort of veil of customer service uh, you know, uh, top level um, satisfaction that's always registered and instead dig underneath and find out what we can do next. I am quite eager to uh, name some initiatives in GSA where we are not just um, sort of saluting around customer service but really getting into the issues of customer intimacy. There, and and there's a, I think there's a, a number of ways agencies need to dig into this. Uh, you know, and there's a lot of theory about customer service. You know, do you need to have the um, uh, uh, do, do you measure it by asking whether or not people would recommend you? Uh, or is that just a, um, uh, a commodity or a quick service kind of a measure? How deeply do you go? How exhaustively do you go? Do you wear your customers out surveying them? And I, I, we need to find ways in which it is easy, quick, and honest. Um, so uh, I'm particularly interested in finding ways in which our building uh, service can uh, explore, uh, explore this because you know, there's nothing like being the landlord to the government, and you know nobody loves their landlord. And we need to dig into what's really griping and what's real service uh, issues. So I think that would be an interesting arena where we can do a lot of uh, digging and learning. I applaud your uh, approach to smart buildings. I have a question, maybe, or a statement. I think the FAR ought to reflect a lot more with regard to policy on smart buildings. I don't see that it does today. Mm -hmm. And secondly, um, maybe it's a question, is why not include the total cost of building ownership when one looks at um, the construction of particularly new buildings, but also the renovation of existing buildings, where you include the out year savings as part of the initial costing. It may be possible to, um, uh, to change the model on how you build buildings versus you know, buying it for a certain set price and not worrying about that 20 year costing. You know, um, I think this is a very interesting and difficult arena for us because frankly, the real estate business is about a financial, um, a financing model and we live in a budget world and therein lies the fundamental conflict. Um, and we are um, clearly constantly wrestling with that because we talk uh, sort of apples and oranges often as a result of that. So that said, um, I think we, uh, I know that our green buildings, smart buildings, our new um, 
uh, technologies around buildings are giving us a tremendous, uh, a tremendously more refined understanding of our operations of a building and our capacities to find cost savings. You know, GSA um, office buildings are 22 percent more energy efficient than their um, than their cousins in the. Uh, private sector. We already have gone a long way in um, wrestling down some of the operating costs in our real estate and uh, we have lessons to, to share. Uh, if, but that was all over hanging fruit. And so the next piece of uh, the smart building uh, and the smart building work will be helpful on it. You know, it's so interesting. If you think about a building, well, think about a car, think about a ship, think about some of the other huge um, infrastructure items that we uh, use in our, our life, and we spend a lot of time on preventative maintenance, we spend a lot of time on education to learn how to run these things, and we are really pretty casual about buildings. Uh, we need to understand that buildings are very complex systems. Just think about it, you have a huge um, uh, high story building, you're trying to adjust the heat and the energy use in it, and every morning, kind of between seven and nine, you know, 2,000 little heaters walk in. And they walk all <laughs> over the building, and they kind of do whatever they're doing, and then they walk out and they come back in. And, and how do you monitor and manage the environment on a micro level so that the energy is um, truly uh, uh, sustainable? So we, I think technologies are giving us a lot of window into this and helping us figure out the next level of uh, precision management we can do in a building. Um, as for your financing question, uh, I think we are uh, engaged in long-running conversation with OMB about the models that we use. And, you know, there's always a silver lining. This budget season is really creating enough crisis in terms of how, you're think how we're thinking about investing in our buildings and our portfolio that we, I think, will reach deeper and find more creative answers. So I think it's the time to have this discussion. And if we can continue to sort of manage that rub between financing and budgeting, um, I'm, I'm comfortable that we're going to come out with some, some new answers. So it's a sort of a stay tuned. I'm very curious how this is going to evolve. Hi, I'm Jeff Myers with REI Systems. Um, federal agencies are often kind of like a stovepipe in a lot of ways. And it seems like GSA has an opportunity that's unusual to look across them. I'm wondering whether or not GSA may have plans around tech staff or perhaps some of the quarterly performance reviews of the agencies to kind of participate or glean information to say where are there opportunities to strongly improve tech capabilities across agencies that might kind of lead GSA to, to some innovation that, that would be really valued by multiple agencies in its kind of core strike zone. Um, not, not that I know specifically, but it's a great idea. I, one of the things about open government that's so important is it's not about sharing all our data and information with the public, it's about sharing our data and information with each other and the government. Uh, so I think we are only now beginning to emerge in the awareness you know, we're beginning to understand that there's a, a whole lot more handshakes that we can be doing across government and some of these tools and techniques we're still uh, you know, kind of getting used to and finding them on the websites and so on. So we're sort of at the embryonic stage on this. I think tech stats would be a very interesting place for us to play, to take that data and to see what opportunities open up behind that. And I would actually like to figure out a way in which we could be putting that up, put up the evidence, and, and, and engineer more conversation about where do people see opportunities across the government where they could be sharing. Um, I, I think our information, despite how we're moving, is still terribly stovepiped. Um, so thank you for that. I'll, I'm happy to carry that back and see what we can do. Martha, we want to thank you so much for joining us this morning and reminding us that it's really not about the IT, it's about the mission, and it's about all of the myriad of services that government has to provide to our citizens in, in a very challenging time. So thank you very much for joining us. Well, thank morning. you, too. I was, it, was, it was wonderful to spend some time. If you have more questions, you got Dave McClure in a couple hours. So. <laughs> <laughs>